Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear Solid series may be heavily inspired by Japanese anime, western comic books, and action movies like The Predator and The Rock, but often enough its equipment, weapons, and vehicles are at least partially derived from military gear and prototypes taken from the real world. Here's a brief video on some of them. Metal Gear Solid 1 opens on board an Ohio-class nuclear submarine. These are not only real, they're the closest to a real-life stealth nuclear weapons platform you can get, not unlike the game's Metal Gear Rex. Equipped with their own nuclear reactor, Ohio-class submarines are fast as they are quiet. After the Cold War, some were actually repurposed as support vehicles for SOFs or Special Operations Forces, somewhat like we see them used as in the beginning of MGS-1. Next we have the M1A1 Abrams main battle tank used in the game by Vulcan Raven. This war machine was first deployed in live combat during Desert Storm in 1990-91, and it played a decisive role in achieving victory there. Thanks to a bevy of state-of-the-art features on board, from thermal sites to the Abrams tank system, providing, via onboard and remote battlefield sensors, digitally assisted situational awareness for the four-man crew inside, the Abrams M1A1s easily outmaneuvered the enemy and could readily adapt to conditions like low visibility, not to mention the Iraqi forces' use of sarin gas. Easily piercing armor, the M1A1 was extremely accurate, adaptable, and fast. Like the Ohio-class subs, it has since the 1990s been replaced with newer versions. One example of gear that's gone from fiction to reality in the 20 years plus since MGS-1 is the exoskeleton. In the 1960s, General Electric tried and failed to construct a bipedal exoskeleton named Hardy Man. In the 80s, designers out of Los Alamos conceived of Pitman, a full-body exoskeleton to be used by soldiers in the field, but it stayed on the drawing board. And in the 90s, the US Army yet again tried, and did not succeed, to produce this military-grade exoskeleton. Only recently have such inventions actually materialized. Then there's what Hal Otacon Emmerich thinks Rex is designed to be, a theater missile defense platform. First deployed in combat during Desert Storm, these missile platforms were designed to shoot down Iraqi Scud missiles with so-called Patriot missile countermeasures. In 2001's Metal Gear Solid 2, the pseudo-realism continued. First off was the inclusion of an unmanned aerial vehicle, the Sikorsky Cipher. According to Sikorsky, the Cypher was developed as an aerial reconnaissance asset to provide real-time targeting and tracking in a high-threat battlefield environment. Next, the game gave us the KA-60 Kasatka, also known as the Killer Whale. The KA-60 is yet another stealth vehicle, using as it does a low thermal signature and a coating that absorbs infrared and radar pulses. It was designed as a transport chopper for moving in or out of hostile zones. Then there was the inclusion by MGS-2 of the AV-8B Harrier II, a vertical takeoff and landing capable fighter jet that has the hovering abilities of a chopper and the almost supersonic speed of a fighter plane. Like the KA-60 in a way, the Harrier II is well suited for special so-called expeditionary operations, where fast maneuvering and tactical mobility are both key. The character Fortune used a miniaturized version of the same armament as MGS-1's Metal Gear Rex, the Railgun. This real-life weapon harnesses, instead of chemical propulsion, electromagnetism. The Railgun is, rightly so, for Fortune's background, associated with the US Navy. Finally, for MGS-2, we have the Arsenal Warship, a real-world proposal in the 1990s for a kind of next-gen aircraft carrier. 
It would have been the first stealth aircraft carrier in history. The military, under the Revolution in Military Affairs and their so-called 2020 Vision Plan, sought to pre-program the next two decades of military, doctrinal, and technological advancements. This stealth aircraft carrier, as I called it, almost like a giant submarine, would have left very little of itself visible above the surface. MGS-3 would provide even more prototypes and real gear derived from the real world, this time from the height of the Cold War era. The game opened with a detailed depiction of the MC-130E Combat Talon, which in reality did not actually begin combat operations before 1966. Because the Combat Talon flies without support, it uses sensitive and sophisticated sensors to monitor the airspace. Operation Snake Eater begins, meanwhile, inside a Lockheed YF-12 Blackbird, a prototype craft that was never actually mobilized in combat operations due to budget cuts. It did, however, serve as a reconnaissance craft, and the Blackbird's unbelievable cruise speed over Mach 3 led to the development of its big brother vessel, the world's swiftest aircraft for the last 40 years, the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird. The flying platforms you encounter in the Mangrove Swamp are based on two different vertical takeoff and landing platforms, the Hiller VZ-1 Pawnee and the Williams X-Jet. The X-Jet was devised as the missing link, Metal Gear style, between helicopters and small unmanned crafts. The first test flight, though, wasn't until April of 1980. Finally, there's the real-world M28 or M29 Davy Crockett weapon system, a gun barrel style recoilless nuclear gun developed during the Korean War. The real Davy Crockett wasn't manually operated, however, but rather fired from a tripod launcher or was mounted on a jeep. They required a three to five man squad to operate and were never actually used in the field, though they were tested. One of the reasons they were never adopted was due to their very low accuracy and extreme danger. MGS-4 brought the series into the near future once again, just like MGS-1 and Sons of Liberty had. The game's focus on military bio-robotics seemingly drew from real-life projects like Big Dog, a DARPA-funded quadruped robotic dog developed by Boston Dynamics from 2005. It wasn't until the release of MGS-4 that in 2011, the Red Cross actually released a report and held a conference on the ethical, legal, and societal implications of using autonomous weapons systems, signaling the importance such platforms and machines might play in the very near future. The importance to MGS-4 of AI satellites like the so-called SOP system have also proven to be more accurate as a version of our near future than they first seemed as well. According to The Verge magazine, spy satellite project Sentient, created by the National Reconnaissance Office, has been a secret project since at least 2010. It's described as an artificial brain that in theory would be capable as a so-called omnivorous analysis tool of ingesting high volumes of data in space taken from battle spaces around the world and processing it. The exact details, however, remain classified. Speaking of artificial intelligence, the topic for MGS Peacewalker was AI, or otherwise automated nuclear deterrent systems, which not only paid homage to Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove and 2001 A Space Odyssey, but also referenced a real Soviet-era contingency plan, Dead Hand. In 2019, ironically, deterrence advocates Adam Lothar and Curtis McGiffin actually advocated for the U.S. to adopt its own version of Dead Hand. Lothar and McGiffin argue, quote, it may be necessary to develop a system based on artificial intelligence with predefined response decisions that detects, decides, and directs the strategic forces with such speed that the attack time compression challenge does not place the U.S. in an impossible position, end quote. For MGS-V The Phantom Pain, the series would return to the past with a variety of settings that took players across combat zones in the developing world from Angola to Afghanistan. And even though much of the technology in the game resembled a curious Orwellian hodgepodge of past, present, and future, a few things the game did make sure it got right concerned the Afghan-Soviet war. 
Like back in MGS-1, MGSV prominently featured a Soviet gunship, the Mi-24. Technically, the one from MGS-1 was actually the export model, the Hind D. Known as Crocodile in the East, these gunships were usually sent in to kill anything that moved Vietnam style in difficult to navigate mountain ranges, which often led, more often than not, to friendly fire and war crimes, badly demoralizing the Soviets and enraging the Afghan populace. Another real-world piece of gear seen in the game were the Soviet 108th Motor Rifle Division, who deployed alongside the 40th Army in Afghanistan to suppress an uprising against, in turn, a recent communist uprising there, in a nation basically soon to be known for endless civil wars and uprisings due to outside interference. The Motorized Rifle Division illustrated how the Soviet forces were built to wage World War II-style conventional warfare. When these huge lumbering mobile armors found themselves often ambushed from above winding passes or from down inside some Saudi-built complex of caves, their enemies would melt away like mist. The only advantage the Soviets had over the Dushman, or bandits as the Soviets called the Mujahideen, were the gunships. But that all supposedly changed with the introduction, courtesy of the CIA, through Pakistan's ISI, of the Stinger missile launcher. Called the Honeybee in the Phantom Pain, the Stinger has been a serious staple since the 1998 original. Resembling Joy's version of the Davy Crockett somewhat, the FIM-92 Stinger uses an infrared light homing system, which put the Soviet gunships at risk. The homing system represented the beginnings of a wider generational shift in the US military that I referred to earlier called the RMA, or Revolution in Military Affairs. It would have a profound impact not only on American but global society, least of all providing the evolution of the 3D polygon-based video game. Well, that about wraps it up. Consider liking and subscribing, and maybe I'll do a follow-up video on MGS's weapons and other gadgets. Otherwise, until next time, boss.